morning. Welcome to our service this morning. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we pray that you would allow this moment to be meaningful. Allow us to connect deeply with you and with each other, even if we are not in the same room. Uh, just allow us to be aware of the moving of your spirit that is not restricted by time or space. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. This morning, Trevor will be leading us through our new series. We're starting our new series, which is all about the resurrected Jesus, just different times when Jesus appeared to different people and what those appearances meant to those people and to us. And today, Trevor will be looking at the story of Doubting Thomas, as we know him, uh, as we've started to call him. But as our call to worship... I'd like to read from Psalm 94, from verse 18 through to verse 19. Uh, the psalmist reminds us that uh, doubt, anxiety, concern, those are all part of everybody's faith journey. And yet God has this incredible way of meeting us even when it feels like we're slipping. And so I'm reading from Psalm 94, from verse 18 through to verse 19. When I said, my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Thanks be to God for his word. We are thankful that in our weakness, God is strong that God does not need us to have everything together, to have all our faith together and alive. God needs us to be honest. And so we are thankful that God meets us even when it feels like we are slipping and anxiety has won. Before, I, uh, before the worship team leads us in worship, just a reminder that we are still collecting for the KZN relief so if you are able to either make a donation to KZN Relief, if you just mark it as such, it'll go to that. Alternatively, if you're able to come and drop off some things here at the church, we're collecting food, clothing, toiletries, uh, water, all of that. And we're hoping to send out a truck uh, within the next couple of days. And so if you're able to make a donation or come and drop off some stuff for the KZN Relief, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And thank you to the response. Our faith hall here in Northfield is full, full of donated goods from people all over, uh, from different churches, different faiths. It's just been incredible to see a community come together in order to support our brothers and sisters down in KZN. Thank you. Good morning, church. Thank you so much for being with us to celebrate our Lord and Savior. Won't you join us as we worship together?
very, very warm word of welcome to you as you join us here at the uh, Northfield Methodist Church uh, in Benoni. We're in a sermon series at the moment uh, focused on those resurrection stories, those resurrection encounters between the risen Jesus and his disciples. Today we are looking at that encounter between the risen Christ uh, and Thomas. It's a remarkable story. Really pray that today, through the story, uh, God will uh, speak to each one of us. So listen carefully again to the story uh, as it's recorded for us in John uh, chapter 20. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, uh, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks uh, in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet have believed. And so we thank God uh, so much for, for that resurrection encounter. We pray that through it, uh, God will speak to each one of us uh, today. I want to begin today with a, a, a very personal question uh, that I would like to offer to you. I wonder if you have ever struggled with doubt. You know, whether you've ever wondered whether, you know, is God really real? Whether you've ever wondered, you know, does, does God really care for us individually? Whether you've ever wondered about prayer and whether it makes any difference whatsoever. Whether you've wondered sometimes about the resurrection, you know, whether Christ really was raised from the grave and is present with us today. Have you ever struggled with doubt? Maybe, maybe you're struggling with doubt right now. And if you are, I want to say to you that I, have, that I have prepared today's message, especially uh, with you in mind. So it's against the backdrop of this question that I've asked you that I want us to explore this encounter uh, between the risen Jesus uh, and Thomas. I, re I read the story to you earlier. I, I'm sure that you have some sense of the details of the story. The story begins that Thomas is wrestling with doubt. But that's not the way the story ends. The story ends with Thomas finding a deeper faith. It ends with him uh, crying out to Jesus, my Lord and my God. For Thomas, his doubt was a pathway to faith. 
Can I say that again? For Thomas, his doubt was a pathway to faith. And so I'm praying today that that may be true for you and me. That maybe as we wrestle with our doubts, that somehow today they may begin to become a pathway to a deeper faith, a deeper trust, a deeper confidence in the living God. And so just for a few moments, I want us to, uh, to dig deep into the story. I want us to keep one foot uh, in the story between Jesus meeting Thomas in his doubts, and I want us to keep our other foot in our own lives with all our doubts and questions. And I'm praying that as we do that, that we will have a sense of, of God speaking a very, very personal word to each one of us. A sense maybe even of, of, of Christ stepping out of the Gospels and becoming for us a living presence wherever we may be right now. So will you notice a few things with me? Will you notice, first of all, that Thomas's uh, experience of doubt, it reminds us that, that doubt is part and parcel of the human experience. To be a human being <laughs> is to be prone to doubt. Ever since Adam and Eve doubted God's word in the Garden of Eve, Garden of Eden, ever since then, ever since then, humanity, including you and me, have been plagued uh, by doubt. And doubt can be a very, very painful thing, even in our human relationships. Just think of a marriage, perhaps, where one of the partners becomes doubtful as to whether uh, their partner really loves them, really cares for them, is really interested in them. It can be a very, very painful thing to doubt someone else, even another human being. And even more so uh, when it comes uh, to our relationship with God. Now, doubt can enter our life through many different doorways. But I think one of the main, main doorways through which doubt enters our life is through the experience of suffering. Over these past few days, we have witnessed the extreme suffering of people down in a KZN. Over 450 people who have lost their lives, countless people missing, people who've lost possessions and homes. The, the devastation has been overwhelming. And when one witnesses that suffering and opens our hearts and minds to that suffering, it's, it, it's so easy for doubt to enter our lives. Does God really care? Why didn't God do anything about this? How can this happen to, to ordinary men, to ordinary women? And these are questions of, of painful doubt. And even in our own lives, when we go through times of, of, real, um, of real suffering, of struggle, of loss, of grief, it's so easy for, for doubt to begin to fill our hearts and minds. I'll never forget the last time I was with uh, Compassionate Friends, uh, the organization that exists to serve uh, parents who've lost children. I spent a Saturday afternoon there. And I just remember listening to the, the painful stories of, of parents who had lost children. And I began to witness again how these losses had, as it were, robbed them, many of them, of their faith and their trust and their confidence in a caring and loving and compassionate God. 
Now, I want you to notice, now I want you to notice this, that Thomas, as he, he battles with doubt, I want you to notice that he doesn't isolate himself. Yes, he wasn't there the first time uh, Jesus was with the, his disciples, but we are told that a week later he was with them. It was almost as if he was willing to, to bring his doubts into the community. I think that's so important. You know, that if we struggle with doubt, not to isolate ourselves, and not to cut ourselves off from community, from church. The community of faith, the church, it's a place where we can bring our doubts, where we can share them. Never forget when Debbie and I, uh, we, we, for a number of years, we met with groups of 30-year-olds in our homes. And with each of those groups, we had what we call a doubt night. And we had an opportunity just to bring our doubts uh, into community. It was always moving to hear from one another how people were struggling with doubt. And then to listen to some of the stories uh, behind those doubts, because so often those stories are very, very painful. So if you're struggling with doubt right now, will you know that, that uh, it's, 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 it's a human thing to doubt? I hope that you won't be ashamed of your doubt. I hope that you will not allow your doubts to isolate you, but that you will bring them with you into our times of worship. But let's go back to the story. Will you notice how Jesus reaches out to Thomas and seeks to help him? Uh, and he does this, it would seem, in two ways. On the one hand, did you notice this? The first thing that Jesus says to Thomas, as Thomas is together with the disciples, the first thing that Jesus says to them is, peace be with you, peace. I find that very striking. Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas uh, for his doubts. He, he doesn't judge Thomas for his doubts. He doesn't criticize Thomas for his doubts. Doubt, doubt itself is not a sin. I think that's why when you read the letter of Jude, chapter 1, verse 22, we read these words, be merciful to those who doubt. And obviously, uh, that verse comes directly out of, out of Jesus' life himself. He was merciful to those who struggled with doubt. And so as you struggle with doubt, that is the first word God speaks to you today. Peace, just peace, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And then I want you to notice how Jesus um, seeks to help Thomas by offering him some evidence to believe. Uh, you may remember Jesus says to him, Thomas, put, 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 put your hand on my side. Put your finger into my side. He was wanting to, to help Thomas to take that step of faith. Now, obviously, uh, Jesus is not with us right now in the same way that he was with Thomas. But I want to suggest, I want to suggest, and I want us to think carefully about this. I want us to suggest that God, God gives us uh, evidence. God gives us reasons to believe. Just like uh, Jesus gave Thomas some evidence, so God gives us evidence to help us to take a step of faith. Faith is not an irrational thing. Uh, there's something deeply rational about faith. God says to us today, I want you to look at some of the evidence I've given you. Look, let's start here. Look at creation. Look at creation. Go out one night, just look. Look at the skies, the stars, the moon. You know, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to go out into creation to take 
to take all of it in and then to say, what a glorious accident this is. It's very hard to say that. As one looks at, at creation in all its beauty, in all its wonder, in all its intricacy, there's a creative hand here at work, an intelligence, a mind. Even as creation continues, this very moment uh, as I'm speaking. So look at creation. Uh, someone has said creation is God's first Bible. Uh, I like that. God says to us, look here, if you're struggling to believe, look, look at the evidence of the early church. Just look at the lives of those early disciples. You know, on Good Friday, it's a historical fact, Jesus is killed. They were heartbroken. Their lives were shattered. Within a few days, those same disciples who were grieving, whose lives had been shattered, who were filled with despair, these same disciples are filled with a new energy, a new hope, and a new purpose. How does one explain that? rationally. How does one explain that transformation that came into the lives of those early disciples? And the only explanation that, that fits those, the, the, the historical data is that something must have happened. Resurrection. Christ was raised. Look at the evidence. Perhaps also just look at the evidence of those deep longings in your own heart right now. Why are you listening to this? Huh? Somehow deep within us, don't, there are these longings for, for connection with God, longings for truth, for meaning, for purpose. Huh? Who put those longings in our hearts in the first place? Where do they come from? The writer to the Ecclesiastes says, God has placed eternity in the heart of every human being. And so today, as we struggle with doubt, uh, it's not a sin. Let's look at some of the reasons that may encourage us to believe, to trust. But I want you to notice one last thing. Will you notice that there comes a very, very uh, clear moment where Jesus challenges Thomas and says to him, Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. I have a hunch that Jesus knew that if we, that if we allow... Um, our doubts to take over our lives, it isn't long before we slip into a deadly unbelief. We, we get stuck in our doubts. We get paralyzed in our doubts. And I think that's a great tragedy. And so there comes a moment, I believe, even in our doubts, when we need to respond to the challenge of Jesus to stop doubting. Uh, and to believe. Have you noticed from your own life, certainly I've noticed this from my life, you know, I've never made a big decision in my life based on certainty. Never. When I got married over 40 years ago and I got married to Debbie, I had no certainty that she was going to remain faithful to me. It was a step of trust. It was a step of faith. I think of people who've begun businesses, for example. They don't begin a business based on certainty that it's going to succeed. It's, it, it's an act of trust. It's an act of faith. People who begin a course of studies, you don't begin it with certainty. You begin it with faith and trust. And I think it's exactly the same in our relationship with God. We don't wait for certainty. Even in the midst of our doubts, we, we take a step of faith. 
Now you may say to me, Trevor, what does the step of faith look like? And I just want to be very simple, very practical in response to that question. I think we take a step of faith when we say to Christ, Christ, I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to give my life to you. We take a step of faith as we, as we open up our life to Christ's presence. We take a step of faith as we begin to, to share with Christ each day what is on our hearts and what we're struggling with. We take a step of faith as we begin to take the teachings of Christ bit by bit. And with his help, we begin to put those teachings into practice. And it's as we take a step of faith that Christ increasingly becomes real and present in our lives. And that has been the experience of countless Christ followers throughout the centuries. So let me end. I don't know if my words have been helpful. I really hope they have. Are you struggling with doubt? I hope that you won't be ashamed of that at all. Um, doubt is a very human thing. Bring your doubts into worship. Uh, share your doubts with, with, with the fellow believers that you can trust, with God. Hear, God. hear God say to you in the midst of your doubts, peace be with you, peace be with you. Look at some of the reasons that God gives us for belief, for faith, for trust. Look at creation. Look at the evidence of the early church. Listen and look very carefully at your own longings in your own heart. And then, with whatever faith you have, and it doesn't mean have to be much, take a step of faith. And as you do that, you will begin to discover in your own experience the reality of the living God. May God keep you, bless you. May God meet you today in the midst of your own doubts. Amen. Now unto him who is able